Welcome to VaderBox. I'm Bambi Francisco, and with me is Ezra Royzen. He's a digital media investment banker and our VaderBox regular. And once again, we have Marissa Meyer. She is the VP of Search and Search Products and Consumer Experience at Google. Thanks again, Marissa, for joining us. And we've got today we are looking at App Savvy. So this is a fairly new company. They call themselves a consulting business. Um, they are an interactive advertising agency and they actually reach out to brands and they do uh, custom campaigns for essentially Facebook apps or apps across social networks. So let's take a look and just listen to this pitch. So today we have um, over 500 application companies signed, which is about 100 application companies. So that's about an average of five companies. Uh, five apps per company, but it's really anchored by 15 of the top 25, which we consider the most utilitarian um, utility applications that sort of benefit and help users uh, on Facebook around their favorite interests. Um, everything we do is third-party reported through DoubleClick, and what we really focus on in app savvy outside of media is selling integrated sponsorships, contextual relevance, opposed to just banner buys. Um, tracking is very sophisticated. Um, we use DoubleClick for standard metrics that we've been looking at for years, like click-through rates and impressions, but we also try to educate the agency community to consider engagement metrics, which could be anything such as time spent, um, um, specific um, um, components maybe to an ad campaign like entries, views, submissions. So we're trying to, we're trying to, um, to move the needle a little bit to consider social media as new metrics and not saying that social media should be, should be viewed as the same way that you would buy CNN.com. That doesn't really make sense. I think that there, there needs to be a lot of education about how you monetize these kinds of properties. Mm -hmm. A lot of traffic, growing market. I'm sure Madison Avenue barely even understands what they are, let alone how to actually put ads in them and where you put ads in them. And I don't think in many cases it's a place where you can just do a big volume approach. So you've got to have some intelligence. There's got to be a scalpel to be able to actually make those campaigns work. Um, but it's a very tricky problem. A lot of crappy page views and a lot of things which are going to be, you know, very low, my guess, is CPMs for a long time until mm -hmm. we can figure out really how to turn those into useful brand experiences. Because you're not going to get click-throughs because it's the furthest thing from a search app where someone knows what they're looking for. They're right. just literally looking not at ads. They're engaged, highly engaged in something else, yeah. whatever they're being entertained by. Yeah. And so if you're not part of that, selling the banner, selling the thing, I don't care how much you throw up there, they're just not looking yeah, at it. I think I mentioned this to you before. It's hard enough for contextual ads. They're probably lower CPMs because you're concentrating on reading and doing what you yeah. have to do. How much more when you're engaged? In a social network, it just seems like you just ignore everything around you and you don't really have time to... You know, to look at an ad, it's just not the, the, the time, the, right. the optimal time. Anyway. And it's really interesting when you look at search versus, say, a social network in terms of the amount of attention you have from the user on each page. Right. right. Some, you know, really active searchers might do 10 searches in a day. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's really active on a social network will do 100 plus page views per day. Right. Yeah. So you sort of, you know, that means you're getting like one tenth the amount of attention mm -hmm. on each page, and it makes it really yeah. challenging. So then you have to say, how do you make the ads meaningful? Right. I think the issue is that's going to be different for every app. To produce the most meaningful ad, mm -hmm. you're really going to have to think about, well, wait, what is this app trying to do, and where, you know, how should it interact? I actually mm -hmm. think that some of the most interesting ads and apps I've seen are where the application itself really is an ad. Mm -hmm. There was a great uh, social network um, I looked at in Sweden called Play Ahead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there, you know, they would do things where, for example, you would get a pet on your homepage, and as it grew, suddenly you would develop zits when it hit right. puberty. Oh, and right. you'd have to run around the website and find the Clearasil nice. to clear it. And it turned out the whole thing was an ad for Clearasil. Oh, oh, that's that's but like, it was that's really, great. it was really yeah. built in. And we know it's interesting when we look at things like Google Gadgets, Again, yeah. what we're really trying to do is we view the gadget in many ways as an ad or a method of distribution itself, yeah. right? This is a way for, you know, Netflix would never be my home page, but now it's part of my home page and I even get some functionality and I can right. use my queue, you know, I can change my queue from there. So it's, it's interesting to think about. I think the real consulting service they can provide is by picking out a few high volume apps, mm -hmm. thinking about what's the most meaningful advertising experience you can mm -hmm. provide that will, because the way you're going to get the attention is by making the ads really meaningful mm -hmm. and putting a lot of attention on what's the right format, what's the right advice for those apps and then how to done, scale it out. I think they've done a good job with uh, Sony's Pictures Made of Honor where they promoted that in the wedding channel. Right. So that made sense. So they're doing a lot of contextualizing there sure. and focusing on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I love, I, I was just, as you were talking, I love Scramble. 
online, which is a sort of you play against your friends, kind of real, play a real quick like boggle basically online. If they had a thing where every time you had a word that was a brand or something and you got an extra point or a few extra tokens or something, that'd be great because I'd, I'd notice the brand, brand. <laughs> I'd think of the brand, and I'd think of the and I and I'd get a point and I'd be whatever. It'd be it'd be something okay. useful. So uh, forty thousand gadgets on iGoogle is that is it, is yeah. It so would you so use tens of thousands. would you use an app savvy to help you? Well, I think that App Savvy is really much more targeted at the app developer, right. Okay. right? The person who's creating that right. gadget. So, you know, for uh, for us, you know, we're going to look at the overall user experience, what makes sense. So, like I said, we actually, in some cases, think of the gadget themselves as, the as an ad, a very meaningful ad, right. and an ad that's rich with functionality. Right. But but it is the ad. And then for it's interesting for people are coming up with new types of gadgets mm -hmm. that might not have a separate business model. If you're Netflix, it's great. You've already got a business model. Mm -hmm. Uh, it turns out one of our most pop popular gadgets is an atomic table. Mm -hmm. We had this high schooler uh, named Caleb from Arkansas who came on, built all of the best gadgets because he built gadgets that were what high school kids would need. Mm -hmm. And you'd think that'd be social networks, but it was basically things like periodic tables. Right. How do you monetize a periodic table? Right. I don't know the answer to that question, but those are the types of hard things that right. AppCavi is going to have right. to deal with because you're going to have some clients that have a working business model on their own and the gadget or the application is just to drive people into that business model. Then you have people who are really trying to develop a new business model online based on that functionality, and that's hard. It's a hard problem. Now, do you think their model should be one? One route could be they clearly say they're a consulting business, so interactive agency. They really work closely with brands and closely with the app developer to create this great creative. Um, that's one route. They could be sort of an economy, which is more analytics. You know, and they're, they're doing some measurement as well. So should they focus on um, really being that provider of, you know, knowing how many, you know, times a, being, being, the, being, the, being the company that defines what user engagement is and really capturing that, that data? And, um, I would it, say it, don't it, do both. Right. I think that the reality <laughs> is do one or the other. Think about who you are, what you're trying to get out of the business, what your kind of lifestyle you want to have, all the things that go into deciding if you're a product company or a service company. And if you're a product company, then you need to just build products. And I think people who try to do consulting companies and sort of back into product companies, mm -hmm. you've, you've moved into a very, very, very rare breed of companies that are able to make that transition. They end up normally messing up both. I, well, I don't know that I agree with that because okay. I think that the analytics part of it, well, they mm -hmm. might not have to necessarily offer that as a service. Mm -hmm. They certainly need to be able to measure the advice they're giving. Mm -hmm. right. Was this good advice? Was this not good advice? So they're going to need some measure right. of user engagement, some measure of, of you know, how well are these ads working. If we right. try it here versus try it there, if we try this ad versus that ad, yeah. which ones actually work? They need to have that feedback loop in order to give good consulting advice. Mm -hmm. So right. you know, I think de facto, they're going, if, for them to be successful, they're going to have to develop a good right. metrics and analytics system. Whether or not they right. choose to productize that, is a whole other is a whole other question. Now, what yeah. about the challenge of? I believe they made fifteen and seventy five thousand dollars for that Sony ad, the Maid of Honor ad, um, and I think that was a month per month. So the challenge that I see is being able to have recurring revenue. How do they do that? Do they do it's a royalty brutal. Model I mean, I ran a consulting company for a number of years, and if you don't have the, the, the consult the consulting project business is a function of rate and utilization. And it, you know, if you have X number of resources and they got to be utilized this much, you can charge this much, that's the, the algebra that basically makes it successful. And so you have short projects, leads to choppy utilization and long sales cycle, and you know, maybe high rate, but still big problems in one of your numbers. Um, it's just a tough business. So if they, maybe they can do a licensing model, so you know, they can create some of these apps and license them out and share in part of the creative. So if they have really good creative talent, they can license it. And there's a lot of models that they're probably licensed creative, even on advertising creative. So I you think mean getting the royalties. Yeah, getting royalties for the for the activity they're doing. But they have to do something. If they're, if they're not going to be doing substantial projects or recurring, right. large recurring, they found themselves in tricky ground from finding a good sustainable business model. Right. Well, I think my my summary is is even simpler than that. They need to be scalable, right. and you need an exponential effect. And, I, and my concern is that consulting businesses are often very linear. Sure. Mm -hmm. How many jobs do you have? And, and your success is linear based on the number of jobs as opposed to exponential. Right. So how do you get that scale? When, when each app needs so much individual intention and so much individual consideration right. in order to produce a successful outcome like Maid of Honor, how do you really get the scale yeah. effect that you need in order to get the exponential returns? Yeah. Right.
but there is a business for it, so right. just don't we don't know how large. Although let's see, let's let's take a look at the liquid scenario. I'm like scenario. linear algebra. She's like exponential <laughs> physics. So it's just a question. Yeah. Liquid. Wait, <laughs> a question of resources. How you can say? <laughs> this company already raised three million dollars, so um, you know not too much, but enough uh, that they need to have a, a pretty good outcome here. So. App Savvy closed a three million Series A round in October um, after an angel round in April. So, looking at a Quantiv, Blue Lithium, and 24/7 Real Media, they all fetched hefty price tags in acquisitions. Yahoo bought Blue Lithium less, last year, less than three years after Blue Lithium closed its first round of financing. While Blue Lithium was focused on the traditional ad network model, App Savvy is part of the first generation of social, social media engagement marketing companies. Essentially, it's an interactive ad agency for applications on social networks. App Savvy has strong ad industry ties, including Paul Oliver. He's a former senior executive at Overture and DoubleClick as a board member, and each member of the team has built most of their careers convincing the largest advertisers to adopt innovative methods for reaching targets online. This depth of domain knowledge and industry credibility has enabled the company closed close individual deals worth $200,000 to $300,000 and develop relationships with more than 100 social media app developers. Management believes these rela relationships give their network a reach of 50 million users, which would be almost one-third the reach Blue Lithium had when it was acquired for $300 million in cash. Assuming no additional funding is closed and the company can sell for $33 million, which would be around Blue Lithium Series A post-money valuation, Series A investors could get 5x on their cash, and management team could walk away with seven digits each. That's the liquid scenarios minute. So, um, so liquid scenarios says that maybe they could sell for $33 million. I mean, I think it's if you, where you choose your comp base on your exit scenario. Sure. So if you look at Blue Lithium, Quigo, Adify being a platform for those kinds of guys, if you, you know, there's lots of ad space exits in the last little bit, yeah. um, last couple of years. I think the trick becomes, are these guys doing the heavy lifting of the quantitative matching of ads and placement and all those kinds of things, or are they doing the more creative aspects, more agency aspects, which are very, which are going to just be much more like agency valuations. So valuation, it sounds like yeah. they're somewhere in the middle, and they have to, you know, I, don't, I would need to know more to know, are they in that range, or are they um, are they more in a, from a valuation standpoint, in a range of, of more like agency businesses? When you say you're a consulting business, it sounds like you're more the, yeah. not the automated scalable I think, I think that's the issue, is that the comparables that they've cited are all companies that have had network effects and have mm -hmm. consequently had scale effects, mm -hmm. right? And it's not, that's not to say that App Savvy won't reach that. Mm -hmm. It's just to say that they really do need to move from that linear model to one that has much more of an exponential effect. They need to be talking about technology stuff if they're going to be how, doing that stuff. How do you create a formula? Drop how do you make it repeatable? How do you make it scalable? Mm -hmm. Drop the consulting? Drop the consulting. Okay. People probably just said that in passing, too, and now we're like totally harping <laughs> Why did I say consulting? I meant customer-oriented or well, something like that. Good. Well, we'll watch this. <laughs> you know, yeah. Okay. Well, that, that wraps it up. So, Marissa, thank you so much. Uh, Marissa Meyer was our guest host today. Ezra Royzen, thank you for joining us, as always. You've been watching Vader Bucks. I'm Bambi Francisco. We'll see you next time on Vader TV.